so we have all these nuclear weapons. We're spending more money on nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, there was this pretty phenomenal study that was done in 2008 uh, by the Brookings Institute, um, which looked and said, okay, well, there's, there's money for nuclear weapons in the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration budget. That's where sort of that $7 billion is. Um, but where else is there money for nuclear weapons? It's not all in the Department of Energy's budget. So uh, Stephen Schwartz and uh, Deep D. Chowdhury did this uh, look at the entire uh, federal budget and found $53 billion worth of uh, spending on nuclear on nuclear stuff uh, throughout the budget. A lot of money on delivery systems for nuclear weapons, um, a lot of uh, money going into the nuclear uh, complex through the Department of Homeland Security, um, uh, through other parts of the Defense Department, and all of this. So, uh, so and they said that is, um, you know, 52, 53 billion dollars is the bare minimum. That's everything they could find, uh, and they called that a ceiling. I mean, I'm sorry, they called that a floor, uh, not a ceiling, right? Knowing that there's um, uh, black budgets, that there's secret money, that there's um, money that they couldn't find. Um, so the United States is still spending a lot of money on nuclear weapons, right? Many years after the end of the Cold War, um, and uh, many years since uh, uh, nuclear Armageddon has been a preoccupying concern of the majority of the American people. Um, but. Uh, but there are more nuclear powers than there ever were before, right? There are the five uh, declared nuclear weapon states who are signatories to the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, who are the five permanent members of the Security Council. Those countries have nuclear weapons. Um, and then, of course, there's India and Pakistan and Israel um, and North Korea. Um, and then, of course, we are preoccupied with um, the possibility, you know, or the likelihood, uh, depending on who you talk to, of, of Iran uh, getting nuclear weapons in the near future. So sort of in this, you know, uh, sort of context right now, um, uh, President Obama went uh, to Prague uh, last April. It's hard to believe it's almost a year ago now. Um, time, uh, time is really uh, flying along. Um, and in front of an audience of 10,000 people, uh, he gave this speech uh, that seemed to uh, be a kind of represent a crossroads, right? Or represent a, a new a new moment in, in time. Um, and uh, and on this in, in enormous international stage, in front of all these people, um, in the heart of the you know the former Soviet Union, in the heart of the old evil empire, right? Uh, he gave a speech and said, uh, "The United States makes a commitment." Uh, to seek the peace and security of a world free of nuclear weapons, and sort of enunciated this new vision uh, of a nuclear weapons free world. Um, and it was very exciting. Um, and he went a step forward, say, uh, a step further, saying, you know, as the only nation that has used nuclear weapons in war, or you know, some formulation along those lines, it's not a direct quote, as the only nation who's used nuclear weapons, the United States has a, a particular and a moral obligation uh, to lead uh, the work for nuclear disarmament. And we can't do it alone, he said, but we really have to lead it. Um, and then he kind of outlined exactly how the United States was going to do that. Um, and uh, some of that's happened and some of that uh, has not. Uh, but what he talked about was uh, ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, and we can talk more about that treaty if you're particularly interested in that. Uh, ratific uh, the finalization and then ratification of a new arms reduction treaty with the Russians uh, to replace the START, um, uh, the START, I guess it's the START II treaty, right, uh, that expired in December of last year. Uh, so he said, you know, we're working with the Russians. Uh, we're going to make this new treaty. Um, it needs to be ratified uh, by the Senate. So we'll finish it, and then we'll get ratification of that. We're going to go to the uh, Security Council. We're going to have this special meeting uh, about nuclear weapons and the Security Council in the fall. Um, and we're really just going to keep moving uh, on this on this uh, topic. And uh, we might not uh, achieve nuclear weapons uh, abolition or disarmament um, uh, tomorrow. It might not happen in my lifetime, but we're really we're going to do it, right? Do it now. Well, yeah. So, um, so that's kind of that was like he, he gave himself a, 
uh, basically a, a work plan uh, for the next four years, right? And a lot of that was supposed to happen very quickly. Um, and of course, some of it has, right? He went uh, to the uh, General Assembly in, uh, what, in September, he made a, another beautiful speech, talked again about nuclear disarmament. He had that meeting with the Security Council um, and, uh, and that uh, arms reduction agreement uh, with Russia is, um, well, it was supposed to be finished by the end of uh, December and they didn't quite get there. And we can talk, um, you know, we can get into the details of, of that if, if people are interested, but they're still kind of, you know, going back and forth on that and hoping that they can get a final agreement signed quite soon. But then that and uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty both have to go to the Senate. Right? And in the Senate, they need a two-thirds majority, right? needs to vote uh, for both of these treaties. Um, and that, I don't know if folks saw the newspaper today, uh, but um, that is going to be difficult. It was going to, always going to be difficult. Uh, now uh, it will be extra difficult. Um, so, and again, we can kind of uh, talk about, um, you know, some of the, what's the word, uh, horse trading. <laughs> Some of the horse trading uh, that's uh, that's going to happen and is already happening around these two treaties. Well, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which is already uh, sort of finalized and just needs to be ratified, and the start, uh, I guess, what would be called the New Start um, uh, Treaty, which uh, is still being fine-tuned. Um, but basically, what uh, what conservatives or Republicans or um, opponents of arms control want um, in exchange for these two treaties is, um, is kind of what the Obama administration has already given them, which is more money for the research and development um, of, of nuclear weapons. Um, so this money that's within the National Nuclear Security Administration budget um, uh, that the Obama administration has already increased and has promised to continue to increase um, in the coming years. Um, and it's this What's the word? Uh, contradiction or paradox? Uh, very confusing when I talk to to young people about um, this and how the administration is promising to uh, disarm and to sort of lead disarmament, and then is also putting more money into research and development of nuclear weapons. Um, Eighteen-year-olds say that doesn't make any sense, um, and people in Washington say that's how politics works, right? And, um, and are ready to kind of accept that, right? That we're going to have to give uh, the labs, uh, the uh, nuclear weapons labs, like Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore and Sandia uh, and uh, the um, five other uh, big installations that make up the nuclear weapons complex throughout the country, we're gonna have to give them a lot um, in order to win a couple key members of the Senate uh, for ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and of the New START. And uh, a fair number of people, and I think I'm kind of coming to that, this place too, say, you know, it's not worth it, right? Um, on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in particular, um, you know, we haven't tested a nuclear warhead since, when? Uh, since 74, 73, something like that, um, in underground tests. Um, we haven't tested above ground since the 1950s, um, and uh, we, we don't you know, plan on starting anytime soon. We essentially have been abiding by the treaty since we signed it, um, even though we haven't ratified it yet. And, um, and maybe we should just kind of not bring it to the Senate um, and not uh, subject it uh, to um, kind of the, the political game, gamemanship uh, that will happen. But um, so that's something uh, we can talk about more if, if people are interested in. A couple things about that nuclear non-proliferation treaty. What's that? What you were saying, maybe not send it to the Senate? Uh, not send it to the Senate? Um, it's, it's a treaty or something? Right, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, was signed uh, during the Clinton administration. Um, and then uh, in 1999, I think, taken to the Senate for ratification and it failed. It, it did not uh, get a two-thirds majority. And so since that time, it's just been a signed treaty uh, that's not been ratified. And under the, what, under the way the treaty was formulated, it doesn't enter into force as international law until um, 
nine nations ratify it, and they list the nations, and the United States is one of the nations. So, um, and until the United States ratifies it, China won't ratify it. Um, I think uh, Russia has already ratified it, but there are a number of other countries that haven't. Um, so the, the argument in favor of bringing it and sort of saying, yes, you know, try to get two-thirds majority, which will be difficult. So wait, wait right. until there's a more liberal Congress, you're saying, maybe. Maybe. I mean, this is, this is one of the things that people in Washington are looking at. When Obama first came in, uh, into office, it looked like, you know, we had two-thirds majority. Uh, we had probably, you know, what some people would say is the most liberal Senate that we were going to get. Um, and then, you know, and then Al Franken came in late and, you know, it look, was looking even better. Um, and now, you know, um, now we're losing some people and we've lost our supermajority. Um, and, uh, and even some Democrats are kind of sniffing the political winds and saying, well, you know, we're not so sure about this treaty. Um, so uh, it's off the you know, it was going to, they were going to try and ratify it as quickly as possible. Um, cert they were trying to do it before the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty meetings come to New York in May. Um, and that's no longer, they're not going to try. Um, and then they're going to put it to the fall, uh, but uh, this fall is an election season. Um, Democrats already feel as though they're, you know, sort of under assault and, and weak, on, weak on defense, weak on sort of military issues. And um, uh, that they, this is not a good sort of environment for them to kind of be pushing for, you know, soft things like arms control and, and uh, international treaties and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, so it's kind of moving off the, the front burner. Is that, yeah. yeah. Um, so then we have the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, right? And uh, folks will remember that this was uh, negotiated in the 1970s and basically struck a bargain right, between uh, the countries that had nuclear weapons at the time um, and the countries that didn't. Um, and it said, you know, we'll, uh, we the nuclear nations, uh, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, Soviet Union, France, and China, those are the five countries with nuclear weapons, we're going to promise to disarm. You know, give us some time because we can't do it overnight, uh, but we're going to promise to disarm. And you, other 185 nations of the world, um, or so, uh, don't, don't get nuclear weapons. Uh, don't pursue them, don't build them, don't research and develop them, um, and, uh, because we're disarming. So you don't really need them. Um, and just to kind of sweeten the pot and make the deal like a little nicer for you guys, um, if you don't build nuclear weapons, uh, we'll give you nuclear power, right? And uh, this can be the engine of your, you know, uh, modernization, your industrialization, your growth um, as an economic power. And, um, you know, doesn't that sound great? And it did sound great. And a lot of countries that were pursuing nuclear weapons at the time gave up their nuclear weapons programs. Um, and this thought that uh, basically, you know, we were going to have every country in the world have nuclear weapons uh, by the early 1980s uh, didn't happen. So South Africa gave up its nuclear weapons, uh, or its nuclear weapons program. Brazil uh, was, um, you know, kind of moving in that direction. It, uh, it kind of forewent, is that the word, forewent? Mm -hmm. uh, foregoed <laughs> uh, uh, nuclear weapons um, in exchange for this atoms for peace uh, kind of formulation. Um, but uh, what didn't happen, right? What didn't happen um, under the MPT? The non-nuclear states didn't get nuclear weapons, but the nuclear weapon states haven't disarmed, right? Uh, and haven't even come close. Um, and uh, new nations have uh, gone nuclear, right? Uh, India and Pakistan both were developing their nuclear weapons programs as the treaty was being negotiated. Uh, they didn't ever sign on to the treaty. Um, uh, Israel was also uh, developing nuclear weapons, um, and uh, it did sign the treaty? No, I don't think no. It no, it didn't. And, and the United States sort of said, you know, um, uh, you, you know, we'll help you with, we'll help you sort of keep this secret, um, and we'll make it okay 
uh, or we'll make it up to you that uh, you won't be signing on to this treaty and you'll sort of miss out on the Adams for Peace. We'll kind of help you out nation bilaterally. Who else didn't sign the treaty? Um, Korea. What's that? Korea. North Korea did sign it and dropped out in 2003. Uh, Cuba, I think, didn't sign the treaty. They said, uh, this bargain, you know, we don't buy it, right? We don't believe that uh, the five nuclear powers are going to disarm. Um, and I don't think they signed it. Um, so, but since that time, you know, the, uh, India and Pakistan tested nuclear weapons in 1998. Um, Pakistan has uh, probably about 80 nuclear warheads. Um, India has uh, maybe 50. Um, Israel by, you know, we don't really know, as, as people have said, it was, uh, uh, is still sort of a, at least an official secret, right? Although about a year and a half ago or two years ago, um, there were some sort of vague uh, proclamations from uh, various members of the Israeli government sort of acknowledging that there was this secret. Um, they and maybe have as many as 200 nuclear weapons, um, Israel. Israel. And uh, North Korea maybe has two or three. We, we, we don't know exactly. Um, and then, of course, Iran, right? Iran's sort of the, who knows, right? Um, so, uh, so the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, this bargain sort of struck between uh, you know, the, the big powers and the rest of the world, um, not working out so well. <laughs> and this new concern um, that uh, another dozen nations could join the nuclear club, right? The knowledge of how to build a nuclear weapon, uh, the materials with which uh, to build them, uh, fairly readily available, right? Um, if a state wanted to go nuclear, um, it could. Um, and if a non-state actor um, is very sort of well organized and uh, very well financed, uh, they too uh, could get uh, their hands um, on a nuclear weapon. Probably couldn't develop a nuclear weapon themselves, um, but could uh, uh, potentially you know, purchase um, a nuclear uh, weapons material, right? Uh, so uh, new threats of uh, both proliferation and then um, threats that um, nuclear weapons, again, could actually be used. Um, and, uh, and so a very sort of uh, scary and unpredictable time, the sort of old world, uh, or old, old world, old school sort of, well, Soviet Union has nuclear weapons, the United States has nuclear weapons, we have more or less the same number of nuclear weapons, um, and uh, they'd be crazy to attack us, we'd be crazy to attack them, so we're, there's this sort of parity here, um, and this stability um, at, uh, you know, at you know, thousands of nuclear warheads each. Um, that uh, stability, if you can, right, if you can call it that, uh, is gone, um, and there's sort of this every, every nation for themselves, every group for themselves, um, and this uh, idea that you know, we could all have a nuclear weapon. We could all threaten one another with nuclear weapons. Um, so, uh, so then the NPT, this treaty, becomes very, very important again, um, and is very fragile, right? Fragile because it's not working, because the nuclear powers are not uh, disarming uh, nearly fast enough. Um, and uh, because uh, the rest of the world doesn't really trust uh, the big powers to um, you know, continue to kind of eat around the edges of their nuclear arsenals um, and call that disarmament, right? And, uh, and so uh, basically a lot of countries are saying this is a make or break year uh, for the MPT. Um, you know, the UN, uh, they come together every, what, every five years to look at the treaty again. This, are, this is make or break, right? Either there's going to be a quantum leap forward and real new um, sort of energy uh, for nuclear disarmament, um, or countries are going to start to walk away. Um, and so sort of in that context, people are beginning to organize uh, for uh, this big meeting. Um, and I, I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here. Um, and so I made, I made about 10 copies of this. Um, not the best designed flyer in the world, a little text heavy, right, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Kind of like hard to read. Uh, but it does give the basic information about, um, about what's happening um, in May. Um, the tree, the, the uh, MPT meeting itself goes from the 3rd of May, uh, which is the uh, you know, first Monday in May, uh, through uh, 
the second Friday, right? So it goes all the first week of May and all the second week of May. Um, and that is happening, of course, at the United Nations. Uh, the weekend before, so it would be, what, uh, <coughs> uh, May 1st and 2nd, uh, there'll be an international conference at Riverside Church. Um, thousands of people coming from around the world uh, to participate um, uh, in the conference, and then a march uh, that will happen on May 2nd through the streets of New York City, uh, sort of um, uh, trying to articulate very, very clearly and pointedly and dramatically um, enough talking, enough treating, um, enough kind of promising, uh, it's time to disarm, you know, now. Um, I think that's what going to be the lead banner. Disarm like, you know, now. <laughs> okay, that was a little joke. Okay. I'll say it again. Disarm like, you know, now. <laughs> Disarm now, right? Disarm now. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, and Peace Action uh, nationally is very involved uh, in the organizing uh, for this. Um, there's a committee, a group of people meeting on a regular basis here in New York City, um, uh, mostly down at uh, 15 Rutherford Place at the AFSC uh, building uh, down there. Um, and a lot of, you know, help needed uh, for, um, uh, for the march on the 2nd. There'll be, you know, tables and a big fair at the end of the march. I think it ends in Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza right near the United Nations. Um, so opportunities for people to volunteer, but also for peace action uh, here in Manhattan to have a table and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so there's some flyers here, and, and maybe there's more information uh, over there about all of that. Um, maybe just before I, I close, um, and we have some. We, okay, um, but uh, you know I'm running out of. You know I just got the one page left, Lillian. So. Yeah. Um, there is this, uh, trying to think of the best way to say it, right? So there are many of us who would say, uh, it got a lot quieter, quieter in here, didn't it? It's really nice. Yeah, the music is over. Yeah, now they're, yeah, they're all listening. Um, you know, uh, many of us would uh, look at the pace of uh, the work that uh, the Obama administration is doing, uh, the sort of contradictions that are there, and really highlight that, right? And highlight, you know, like the, they're saying the one thing and they're doing the other thing, right? They're promising disarmament, but they're putting more money um, into uh, nuclear weapons research and development. Um, and are trying to push him kind of on that, right? To say, you know, this beautiful rhetoric from Prague uh, last year, seeking peace and security in a world free of nuclear weapons, you know, like, come on, like, do it, you know? And then uh, he's also being subjected to pressures from the other side. And I don't have to tell you uh, that those pressures from the other side are uh, much more sophisticated and relentless um, and are sort of um, echoed in the opinion uh, pages of the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Times on an almost daily basis, right? Um, saying the Obama administration is naive, uh, the Obama administration sort of, uh, you know, is uh, caught up in this sort of internationalism and is undermining the security of the United States uh, by trying to uh, get rid of nuclear weapons, which are the keystone of our security as a nation. This is the kind of uh, thing being said uh, by people like John Bolton, uh, by people like Dick Cheney, um, by people like Richard Pearl, right? And, uh, you know, and these guys are sort of making a new name from, for themselves um, uh, and kind of uh, uh, reinventing or having a renaissance of their image, right? They're not the guys who brought us the Iraq War anymore. Now they're these sober realists. Um, who really kind of know what's up, and they're not college professors from Chicago, uh, you know, anyway. So um, this, this pressure is very well organized, um, and, uh, and it um, leads to some tension, right, that, you know, we don't want to criticize the Obama administration for saying the right thing because it's getting criticized so hard on the other side as well. Um, but I think if we've learned anything in the last 
year of, you know, our first year of the Obama administration is that, you know, we've learned about his tendency to kind of, you know, kind of stake out a position, kind of put himself here, and then kind of get, you know, kind of pushed, you know, pretty dramatically and pretty quickly, uh, pretty far away from those positions, right? And the need for, you know, kind of a push coming from the other side um, is really, really critical. And if it isn't there right away, um, then we, we, we seed ground, we lose ground very, very fast. Um, and so on this issue in particular, you know, we do have um, a real opportunity, right? We have a real opportunity because um, the world doesn't want nuclear weapons anymore um, uh, because they do uh, contribute nothing uh, to the security of the United States uh, and they certainly contribute nothing uh, to the security of the world um, and, uh, and because you know it's also this sort of bread and butter issue right we just don't have a lot of money to be um, investing in uh, new and better uh, nuclear weapons um, that are not you know um, that we're not going to use, right? God willing, um, and uh, and so um, so, uh, but we're doing all of this at a time when most people don't know anything about nuclear weapons, um, and uh, and many even progressive people haven't thought about nuclear weapons in 15, 20, even 30 years, right? Um, you know this this I this you know you said, uh, sir, at the beginning uh, that. Uh, St. Freeze had 100,000 people and, you know, um, uh, groups at every college campus and, you know, was this very well organized national organization that doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, and, uh, and yet is uh, more necessary today uh, than ever before, really needs to kind of uh, swell back up. Um, so, and uh, other countries, um, I think, are doing a much it's, it's back. Um, a much better job of this uh, than the United States. Um, and uh, perhaps because they haven't been allowed uh, to forget about nuclear weapons, um, for them the threat never really went away. Um, so, um, so what am I saying? I say, I say you know, we have, a, we have a real opportunity here, an opportunity to be good hosts um, uh, to people from the international peace movement. Um, who are going to be coming to Washington? I think Japan is sending, you know, thousands of people. Uh, France is sending hundreds of people. Um, uh, the European peace communities are sending hundreds of people um, here, not just to participate in the the conference and the march, but then to watch the meeting for two weeks um, and to. Uh, lobby uh, the delegations from around the world um, on this and to help uh, nations, um, you know, like uh, Canada and Mexico and Australia and New Zealand um, who are, you know, just very clearly nuclear free and uh, for nuclear abolition, nuclear disarmament, help sort of amplify and sort of underline uh, their message um, and uh, increase their, you know, heft. Um, at the meeting, um, so uh, so this is a this is all just a very sort of important time, right? Um, and between now and then, um, a couple of things will happen, right? The nuclear posture review uh, will come out. Uh, this is a document uh, developed by every president at some point in uh, his presidency, um, and it says. <coughs> And basically, why does the United States have nuclear weapons, uh, and what uh, are we doing with them? And uh, and uh, in the Times today, uh, there was um, an article about the draft of this NP, what's called the NPR, not National Public Radio, but Nuclear Posture Review, uh, the NPR, um, and kind of some of the things that are in it um, as they kind of leak little bits and pieces out um, about this um, before it comes out. And, uh, and what's in it is, uh, once again, the United States saying, we will not promise to not use nuclear weapons first, right? Uh, we will not promise not to use nuclear weapons first, which means if you take away the double negative, first strike, first strike right? And, um, and so uh, that's still, you know, that's still uh, the policy of the United States. Um, it also talked about, and this is something that I'm sort of particularly interested in, um, is uh, the way in which 
You know, any move towards nuclear disarmament or, or, or even arms control, cutting the number of nuclear weapons, provides an opportunity for the conventional weapons industry uh, to, uh, to move in more, right? Um, so we're not going to use nuclear weapons, but we're going to use more powerful, faster, bigger conventional weapons that have the devastating wallop of a nuclear weapon without uh, the radiation and without the long-term um, kind of uh, <coughs> impact uh, that have made uh, nuclear weapons sort of a, um, a taboo uh, kind of a weapon uh, for the last 65 years, right? And, um, and literally this is how it's talked about, you know, uh, by people like uh, Keith Payne uh, from, uh, where is he from, NIPP, National Institute for Public Policy, I think is what it's called, uh, Dr. Keith Payne, Dr. Payne, um, uh, the nuclear weapons, um, hey, how come we're not using them guy? Um, so, so one of the things that's talked about in the Nuclear Posture Review is the prompt global strike prompt global strike, um, which is basically a replacement uh, for uh, nuclear weapons, um, which is conventional weapons capabilities of all sorts um, that could, in the same time frame, uh, hit and destroy um, you know, a, a, an enemy um, with the same, basically with the same lethal power as a nuclear weapon. And the same sort of psychological, like, whoa, we hit you really hard kind of impact that that would have. Um, so this is something to like kind of look out for, right? Uh, prompt global strike. Um, and to look out for how, how disarmament and arms control are sort of, um, you know, in tandem with uh, increased uh, conventional weapons capabilities, right? That that's going to kind of uh, unchecked, um, you know, uh, if, if we do nothing, right, um, if, and by we I mean, you know, the, the peace movement uh, sort of broadly defined, if we do nothing, uh, the United States will probably cut some nuclear weapons, right? Um, we'll, we'll have this agreement, we'll cut some nuclear weapons, we'll put, a, put together a timeline for cutting even more nuclear weapons, um, and that will just kind of happen whether we do anything, right? Uh, because, um, because some of those nuclear weapons are old, um, uh, some of them are not working as well, or I mean, uh, um, are thought not to be able to work as well as when they were first made. Um, and because it makes sort of political sense, right? It kind of makes us look good uh, in the world. Um, but if we do nothing, um, that will happen and that will be it. And that will be sort of, uh, as I said, in tandem with uh, um, really increasing our uh, conventional weapons capabilities. Now all that's already happening, right? We're just looking at a $700 billion uh, military budget for 2011. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not as though, um, you know, militarism is sort of like on its knees or um, uh, anything. Uh, but uh, so nuclear posture review, uh, prompt global strike, um, and then this agreement uh, between the United States and Russia being finalized, um, and the details of that being kind of put out. Um, the, the sticking points between the United States and Russia right now, um, no surprise, um, have to do with missile defense, right? Um, and uh, Russia, of course, it, it initially was very upset about um, uh, the European missile uh, defense program that the United excuse me, that the Bush administration um, uh, made agreements with, where, with uh, Czech Republic and with Poland about these um, missile defense um, sites there, uh, presumably or sort of um, allegedly or what was asserted to be uh, to keep, you know, Iranian missiles from hitting uh, Europe, right? Uh, Russia, of course, felt very threatened by this. Um, I was all up in arms about it. Uh, the Obama administration has moved it, right? It's not that we're not going to have uh, missile defense in Europe, but it's not going to be so deep into uh, what Russia thinks of as it's near abroad, right? Um, it's going to be a little you know, kind of further away. Um, but, uh, but Russia wants its own missile defense program. Um, it's working on it. Um, it wants the United States to help it. Um, and, uh, and basically, it's holding out. 
um, uh, for this. Another issue um, that's kind of bedeviling the negotiations um, uh, is the question of tactical nuclear weapons, which are not technically under uh, this treaty, um, but are um, you know, an irritant. Um, and I was surprised to learn, and hopefully you guys will be surprised as well, uh, to learn that the United States still has nuclear weapons, US nuclear weapons, in a number of other countries. And maybe you could hazard a couple guess, guesses at where US tactical, so sort of short range uh, missiles are located. Israel, Germany, Germany, Germany. Germany. Great Britain. Turkey. Turkey. So Turkey, yeah. So not Germany any. Oh no, yes, Germany, yes. Germany, Germany yes. Italy, yes. Belgium. Poland. No. No. Turkey and the Netherlands. Uh, the United States has tactical nuclear weapons in all of those countries. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the United States didn't have nuclear weapons in space. We consider ourselves. Right. The commander of space, right. we have a commander, a mill star, which was into which we put $45 billion <coughs> for a strategic, technical, and uh, what was a relay system, right. a global system whereby 120,000 people worldwide in all of these different communities, 50 in America and 130 in the rest of the world, they can communicate and in a flash. The purpose of Milstar is to win and wage a nuclear war. Imagine, this, I didn't make this up. No, no, I know I, you didn't. I read it in oh, blank sure, check by right. like right. Tim Weiner. Right. Weiner. It's frightening. It is frightening. Is it still in, is it still in existence? It's still in planning. Yeah. There's a lot of money for research and development of space-based technologies. There's a lot of imagining of exactly how the United States uh, can control um, can control space, uh, can control other nations' access to space, can to can protect its space assets um, and uh, can use space as a as a battleground or at least a launching uh, pad oh, for yeah. yeah. So this is a good place to. St we're gonna just go right into questions right now. I think I was at the end of where I wanted uh, to be, and I just wanted to look at the time. Eight sixteen. Yeah. I think somebody's going to call, call on. I have the questions and answers. So there's a few things are taken care of. Oh, OK. All right. First of all, uh, we would always talk about what next. Uh, how do we organize? Um, and what is the message that gets across, not only for nuclear, but also um, and try to relate it to people on 86th Street. Uh, there are kids who are just about to lose their their bus passes and right. subway cards because the city has no money. Uh, we don't have enough money for this, we don't have enough money for that, and we're spending billions, just teeny tiny billions on nuclear, but big billions on gas masks, uh, blankets, all kinds of military stuff mm -hmm. because we're at war. So one of the things that would seem to be uh, important is how do we go about organizing so this is not a pipsqueak, uh, pipsqueak march right. of 1,200 people right. but 100,000 people to really send a message to Washington and to build for other demonstrations and to get the politicians to be a little bit nervous because a lot of people are want to spend the money for uh, bread and butter issues right. and not for war. Yeah, and I think that's a great question. And I think one way of doing it is through this, the organizing for this to plug into that. Um, and, uh, and I think one thing that, that Peace Action here and on West End Avenue can do is kind of help take it out of, you know, the, the peace community or sort of the peace 
cul-de-sac uh, where you know kind of we maybe are most comfortable or like it's sort of all that some very busy people can do. Um, but uh, you know, I have found that once people sort of get a little bit of information, they tend to re be really like, "Are you kidding? Like really? Like that's crazy. We still have nuclear weapons. We still have a lot of them. We're still targeting." Uh, Russia, we're still sort of threatening the world with this. Um, how much is this costing? Um, and uh, I would really like to see the money used other ways. So I think people are really open to that. It's just sort of a matter of talking to people. And that's, I think that's the hardest part and where organizing um, is most necessary. So, um, you know, talking in your church, talking in your synagogue, um, you know, uh, meeting with any little group of concern. Um, and, uh, and inviting. Um, and I think that's uh, kind of what organizing needs to be right now, is inviting. Hey, I'm going to this, I'm going to this, um, will you come with me? So on this piece of paper, which as I said I only have 10 copies of, um, the website... You didn't pick any up? You didn't, you didn't pick it up? Okay, that's right. Um, we'll, have, there's, we'll, have uh, we'll have a lot oh, of sure. Um, from the website, you can find out when the next meeting is and download material and all that kind of stuff. Do you have a speaker's bureau? I just need one. I don't know. Why don't you say the website? The Which is peaceandjusticenow.org. Peace and um, and they are trying to do some, you asked about a speaker's bureau, um, they are trying to do some sort of regular public education things, conference calls, speaking, um, a number of Jackie Cabasso and Joe Gerson, a number of other people very knowledgeable about all of this, um, uh, trying to kind of get the word out in, a, in more creative ways, too. So, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry? Well, first, first let me say that uh, there's more literature on the front table. You're all welcome to take as many copies as you want and distribute them to uh, your friends, family, and other people you know. Uh, my question is very much related, I think, to the last question. Uh, terrorism today, whether it's American terrorism or that of our adversaries, uh, is a totally different stance. Uh, and content now that it did 50, 40, 50 years ago when school children were hiding under table under their desks at school to protect themselves against nuclear weapons, which is, is totally useless against today's terrorism, no matter, regardless of from what quarter it comes from. What can we do as peace advocates to convince uh, uh, and to sway people's opinions as to the relevance of currently of, of nuclear uh, disarmament nuclear non-proliferation and a destruction of nuclear stockpiles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I mean, I think you can, yeah. I mean, I think a, a couple different things, but my first reaction is, um, is to really focus on fear, right, and how uh, fear is manipulated and how the fear of the American people in particular um, has been manipulated and used um, in ever more sophisticated and um, uh, nefarious ways, right? Uh, certainly uh, for the last um, nine years, right, since September 11th um, and, um, and then, you know, for long before that. Um, and to encourage one another just not to be afraid um, and not to be, uh, uh, not to allow our fear to be manipulated. Um, and then to be making the connections between, you know, the United States as, as the nation that's used nuclear weapons, um, that has perfected nuclear weapons, has threatened uh, the use of nuclear weapons, at least according to Joe Gerson, more than 40 times um, uh, since uh, 1945. Um, and uh, the terror that that perpetrates around uh, the world um, and the way in which that makes terrorism more likely, um, that it makes it more, um, you know, the rationale sort of more pointed uh, for it um, and how the United States doesn't have a monopoly on force anymore even though uh, we have a monopoly on the tools of force, right? Or we don't have a monopoly on violence, even though we have a monopoly on the, the tools of violence, right? Um, and, uh, and we've seen that very, very clearly as we've gotten bogged down um, in two, 
you know, significant wars abroad. So um, I don't feel like that's a totally satisfactory answer to your question, but it feels like a beginning anyway. Yeah. Okay. I had two short questions. Are you related to the? Make it loud. Uh, yeah. Are you related to Daniel Barrigan by any chance? Uh huh. Oh, you are. Uh huh. Okay. And secondly, this is, there was a lady many years ago. She got 30 years or 40 a long prison term for pouring paint on a nuclear warhead entering a base. Right. What happened to that lady? I forgot her name. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Dan Barrigan is my uncle. Phil Bergen was my father, okay. Liz McAllister, my mom. Um, so, I, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I think the woman you're talking about is Helen Woodson, um, uh, who is a plowshares activist, uh, part of a you know, sort of movement of maybe 100 people, maybe a few more, um, who uh, have uh, disarmed, symbolically disarmed nuclear weapons, um, kind of turning them uh, symbolically uh, from uh, spears into pruning hooks, from swords into plowshares. Um, and uh, Helen uh, uh, should be out uh, next year. So she's sort of preparing uh, for her release and the community is sort of preparing. She, she served the full 30 years, I lose track of time. Yeah, it, it, it didn't end up being 30 years or some time off for good behavior. She spent the better part of two decades in jail though. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Norling, go ahead. I have two questions. When you refer to uh, nuclear weapons, are you in what people refer to nuclear weapons? Do they include the bomb and all these other things like missiles and guns and all that other stuff? Is that part of what we refer to as nuclear weapons is number one? And number two, we have embarked, the president just gave, I don't know how many billions of dollars to build two, uh, two uh, nuclear plants in Georgia. Um, in my opinion, and I'm just a, a really a nobody, I don't think they're safe. We've got nuclear plants all over the country and they're leaking. There are about 27 of them and they're leaking. That's right. And they just stopped one up in Vermont. Now, are we in favor of what we call peaceful nuclear uh, environment or energy? Uh -huh. I'm not. Okay. All right. I'm not. Everybody say no. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so on the first question, um, it's, you know, when people talk about nuclear weapons, they are primarily talking about the warhead and the missile. Um, and uh, so that's kind of what people are talking about. A more broad definition would include the delivery system for the weapon, whether that's um, a Trident submarine or an F-16 fighter plane or a B-2 bomber or, you know, however that nuclear weapon is going to get delivered to its target. Um, but uh, at least in the case of like the F-16 fighter plane and the bombers, um, they can also carry conventional hardware or, you know, conventional weapons. Um, so most people wouldn't point at an F-16 fighter plane and say that's a nuclear weapon. Right? So, and then, uh, um, but like this study that I was talking about where the $50 billion a year on, uh, on nuclear stuff um, includes the money we spend to buy um, new F-16 fighter planes and bombers and stuff like that. So that's a much broader definition. Um, and then, oh. No, go ahead. Oh yeah, and then on the, the second thing, um, yeah, there's a range of opinion on the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, right? And there are some people who say, you know, these are completely separate issues. One's an environmental issue, um, one's a, a military issue. Um, some people would say there is no separation because, um, you know, that uh, every nuclear plant, right, every nuclear power generating station um, is sort of the raw materials, the building blocks of a nuclear bomb. And, uh, and that's what we're seeing in Iran. Iran's a really good example of that, right? They have, a, they, have a, they have a peaceful nuclear program, an energy generation program, um, and they're right at the edge, or they're five years from the edge, depending on who you talk to about it. Um, they're, within the, um, where they're within the confines of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty until they're not, right? And that line is really 
um, not scientific or engineering, it's really a political line, you know, and so as far as some people are concerned, they've crossed it. They crossed it a long time ago. Uh, and uh, according to some other people, including the, but probably most of the International Atomic Energy Agency, they haven't crossed it yet. Um, but uh, a lot of people would say there's more proliferation in the world because, you know, there's more nuclear power know-how. Um, it's also connected in another way through under the Bush administration, um, we made an agreement with India. Um, I think it's called the Indian American Civilian Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, or something that had civilian and nuclear cooperation in it. Um, and basically, it uh, that agreement was an end run around the NPT, which says that um, you know if you're if you're not a signatory to the NPT, you can't have access to this nuclear power know-how. Well, the United States said India um, is a country we want to sort of draw away from Russia. It's a great market for our weapons and uh, lots of other things. Uh, they need nuclear power and we're going to give it to them. And, uh, and so, um, you know, that's another sort of intersection of uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear power there. Um, and then I would just say, yeah, it's, it's uh, very, in my mind, very dirty. We haven't solved the waste issue. Um, and uh, it's profoundly heavily subsidized, right? So this clean, clean and green is kind of the, um, what the uh, industry, the nuclear power industry says, right? Clean, green, and indigenous in the sense that we don't have to import oil from other countries. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's very heavily, heavily subsidized, so it's not, um, oh, clean, green, Clean and green are the same thing. There's cheap in there somehow too, sorry. Um, it's not cheap and it's not, right, because we haven't solved the waste problem, it's not, um, it's not uh, green at all. Um, but there's a, there's a range of opinion there. And some people saying we need to keep it pretty narrowly focused. And some people saying, you know, yeah, as long as we're talking about the issue, let's really talk about the whole it, in its totality. Um, and the conference and the demonstration um, is kind of making that broader argument and talking about nuclear, nuclear power and nuclear free right from the beginning. So, um, so anyway, that answers your question. Don't all the other things come under the term uh, weapons of mass destruction? The, the other weapon she's talking about. Sure, yeah, 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 right. Uh, what do you know about Yucca Mountain? A little louder, we can hear I'm asking what she knows about Yucca Mountain. I was reading an article the other day where they want to make Yucca Mountain the, the final resting place for all the nuclear waste. And it's so tremendously poisonous. And then apparently they had these long discussions going on about how long we should tell the public the waste is contaminated. And uh, although it, the final thing is that supposedly it's going to last for a million years, the contamination, they decided to tell the public 10,000 years because it's a nice low round number or something <laughs> like that. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a more, it's a more manageable number for people. To, to think that we're pouring waste, nuclear waste into Nevada that's going to be around for a million years, you know, and then they're talking about putting up signs saying danger. And then somebody else was saying, well, 500,000 years from now, who, our language will probably be gone, and nobody will know what those symbols mean on the sign, uh -huh. but yeah. did you need that? No, I didn't. He, he was asking about Yucca Mountain, which is one of the places where they want to put nuclear waste, and I actually don't know yeah. a lot about it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's funny that uh, he was also saying that a million years was, you know, that was too uncomfortable and too long for people, so 10,000 years was sort of uh, more comfortable. I don't know if you guys would be comfortable with uh, something that's uh, toxic and radioactive and dangerous for 10,000 years instead of a million. But uh. go ahead, you. Yucca Mountain the project is dead. Announced a month ago by a senator, Harry Reid, that we will not accept Yucca Mountain as a project. So officially, at the Senate level. It's dead. It may come back, right. but it's yeah. dead. So yeah. that's history. Uh, I have a couple of other uh, questions. The nuclear industry uh, makes a number of products. The power industry makes a number of products, and one of them is an element called tritium. Mm -hmm. And they have to get. This is a gas. It's a, a unique gas. It's uh, uh, similar to uh, the hydrogen. 
and it's used, of all things, in every nuclear weapon we've ever developed. It's the pacer for the explosion, so the molecules will not uh, simply go one once, but continue and explode them. And one of the, you can make it yourself if you build your own plant, but here we have a hundred and so odd plants generating this material. So I would like to see the invoices as to where the material goes, mm -hmm. and I would say, for my small research, it goes into the weapons, because every three years you get enough leaks in the warheads, and you gotta pump in some more uh. tritium. <laughs> the last thing is Okinawa. Okay. Uh, there are sites in the outside of the U.S. where the U.S. maintains heavy nuclear weapon deposits. Uh, you know, fill, uh, ready for action. Right. And one of the classic arguments in Japan is when are the Marines going to leave? But the question that the politicians, or maybe the public doesn't do, knows is when are the weapons going to leave? Right. And that has always been a site in the Pacific area right. for our long range uh, storage of the weapons. Right. Um, there are other sites, you can see them overhead every day. They're still flying the uh, B-52s on training missions, hopefully unarmed. And uh, they fly them worldwide. You know, Spain had five bombs dropped on it, five that we lost. Bad connection of the bomb, the nuclear bomb to the B-52. and. So it, it had, there are training problems, mm -hmm. but the training continues. It's a huge... So I'm wondering about the other nations of the world, too. I mean, you speak of something that happened in 1990 or so. The Soviet Union is no longer. So there is no more Soviet Union. So you have how many nations that now have nuclear weapons there? You have Russia. You have the Ukraine. No. No, uh, I mean the, I mean, the Ukraine gave its weapons. All the Eastern, all the new countries that came out of the Soviet Union, gave the weapons back to the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, back to Russia. Um, but Russia maintained the sites in the Ukraine. Right, but the weapons are gone. Ukraine doesn't. Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons. Um, Yeah, I mean they don't. So um, there are sites in those other countries. The United States and Russia are have this cooperative threat reduction program. They're working to kind of move and have been since '91 uh, to move nuclear material, to secure nuclear material, to secure nuclear sites, and then to move uh, that material out of all of those other countries. There was this brief moment where Ukraine was like the second most powerful nuclear weapon state in the world, um, but it didn't, it didn't last long. Um, so, uh, and all those countries signed on uh, to the NPT, signed on to uh, all those sort of international treaties uh, very, very quickly. Uh, they wouldn't have been really recognized as states or been able to get any international aid um, if they hadn't. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Perhaps. all keep their radioactive waste right near them. Right. That's Indian Point. It's just full of right. radioactive waste. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vicky? Oh, I was just going to, I just wanted to say a word about depleted uranium. Okay. Could you speak up, please? I just wanted to say a word about depleted uranium. That I, my understanding was that the, some of the waste was used for weapons. And then we're actually, without even dropping a bomb, spreading radiation in Iraq. Right. And then our soldiers are, you know, coming back sick. But I mean, mainly Iraq. That it, it, there's all kinds of uh, deformities for the children and everything, mm -hmm. as if a bomb had been dropped. Right. Right. Depleted uranium is a huge uh, issue in in Iraq, in uh, Vieques, uh, Puerto Rico, where a lot of the testing of of those materials happened. Um, Depleted uranium has replaced tungsten as a 
sort of a coating uh, on uh, weapons, on conventional weapons. Um, it's very dense, it's very hard, and unlike tungsten, it's very cheap. And so uh, it makes a, a weapon, even a small weapon, um, hardened and then able to cut through um, armor tanks or cut through um, reinforced bunkers and to kind of, um, the way it's described in the military, you know, lingo, or not the military lingo, but uh, the way it's admiringly described is it can cut through um, a hardened bunker like a hot knife through butter, right? And so uh, as that happens, um, uh, the depleted uranium um, turns to dust um, and then, uh, you know, either kind of filters down into the, the ground and then into the water table um, or uh, is, um, you know, kind of breathed in and uh, lodges, because um, it's very heavy and dense, lodges within the, the lungs. Um, so, uh, and it has been connected both to um, all sorts of health effects in soldiers and uh, military personnel and then in um, the next generation, uh, in, uh, particularly in Iraq. Um, but now uh, it's um, sort of, it's standard, right? It's not on just special weapons. It's not just on uh, the weapons we use to shoot at a particular tank that is particularly reinforced. It's just kind of, you know, what's, what's on any new weapon is a, is a depleted uranium exterior. And then in, in other systems it's used, uh, because it's so, you know, dense and heavy, it's used as ballast in, in lots of other, I mean, and I'm not, you know, a weapons designer, I don't totally understand how this works, but it's made to kind of give heft uh, to some other weapons. Um, and then it's used in all sorts of civilian things as well. Um, in fact, there's a golf club uh, that is, uh, incorporates uh, depleted uranium because it, uh, you know, no, not, not kidding, unfortunately. But, um, and it kind of, it did get some attention, um, uh, depleted uranium, uh, but it's not, um, and I was remiss even myself in kind of bringing it into this conversation. Um, you know, it doesn't, it, it, the radiation is a lot less I don't know, intense or severe, then, you know, it's not as though a nuclear weapon was dropped on a rock. Um, but the long-term health consequences of that kind of radiation and toxicity um, is significant. And um, so thanks for bringing that here. Yeah. Uh, I'm particularly interested not so much in what the weapons are, who has the weapons. I want to know why we have such an ignorant uh, populace concerning <laughs> weapons. We're all worried about the increase in price of food and mm -hmm. clothing. What about the price of nuclear weapons? I had the good fortune of being a hostess to Susetsuki uh, Thurlow, and I have a letter from her today. She's coming in among very uh, but ignorant of nuclear weapons a population. Okay, so this is a letter from uh, Setsuko. No, so, she, was not, yeah. she was a 13 year old child, the only one of two students in a school in Hiroshima where the school collapsed and everybody was killed and two survived. She came eventually to study in America, met a, a Canadian, and they're married, mm -hmm. and they're, they've been married quite a long time. Okay, so here are the two ideas. 
At home, the Toronto Peace Community worked hard organizing a number of special events and activities, including marking the 25th anniversary of the Toronto Peace Garden at the City Hall, of which Setsuko facilitated the founding. This event was attended by several thousand high school students. Also organized by the Toronto Peace Community was a commemoration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki Day. We had another significant anniversary this year, the 80th year of Japan-Canada diplomatic relations. The occasion was marked by a visit by the Emperor and Empress of Japan to Canada. In Toronto, Setsuko was presented to the Emperor and Empress as the founder of Japanese social services and a nuclear disarmament advocate from Hiroshima. The Emperor and Empress expressed their warm appreciation for Setsuko's contribution to the Japanese-Canadian community and for her social political activism for the abolition we of nuclear weapons. We the Emperor and the Empress of Japan. Oh, okay. We ought to invite them. Oh, that's not funny. Okay. If we had people like that coming, then uh, we'd wake up. You had a question? Sort of a follow-up to her question. Oh, yeah. Um, you mentioned that you've been on the tour. Um, I'm assuming that it was under the auspices of the New America Foundation. Mm -hmm. But uh, could you say a little bit more about the what you were doing to educate people or what this, you know, how we can proliferate a little bit of preventive uh, information. Right. Yeah, yeah. The, um, right, so the, our project at New America Foundation is very small. Uh, there's just two of us. Um, and, uh, but there are a couple other efforts which are really excellent. Um, there's the Think Outside the Bomb, and I was going to say organization, but it's not quite an organization. But Think Outside the Bomb puts on a conference and sort of interactive set of activities for young people by young people at colleges and universities a couple times a year. I think the most recent one was in Boston uh, late last year. Um, and uh, so that's uh, sort of one really excellent uh, project. They have really good materials that are oriented towards high school students and um, uh, college students um, and very dynamic. And they will be sort of in full effect uh, in uh, April and May uh, here in New York. Um, and their website is uh, thinkoutsidethebomb.org. Uh, um, there's also the Cyber School Bus. Um, you're a teacher, right, Florindo? Um, the Cyber School Bus is a, a, a UN project, um, and it's literally this it's kind of like the it's kind of like the peace boat, but for teenagers. Um, and uh, and it's this uh, school bus that's sort of tricked out with all of these games and um, uh, computer games and interactive sort of displays um, about uh, about nuclear disarmament and um, uh, the resources that go into militarism versus the resources that go to meeting uh, human needs. Um, and, uh, and so these aren't the only things that are going on. These are two really good ones that are kind of local. Uh, the Think Outside the Bomb is, um, uh, you know, kind of makes its way up and down uh, the eastern uh, seaboard pretty regularly. Um, and, uh, you know, the real problem is, is that it's one school bus, you know, and it's, uh, it's one conference that is staffed by one small group of people that goes to different colleges, as opposed to, like, you know, a hundred school buses and a conference, uh, kind of a good, solid, fun conference uh, for young people at every single college around the country, right? Um, and I found, you know, like that, um, that young people really want to know this stuff, um, that they're really kind of hungry for it, you know, um, and uh, really interested. It's just they're not having these conversations with anybody. Um, so, uh, yeah. Is that what you were doing? That's, one of the that's yeah. When so when I did this little tour, I mean it's kind of yeah, it wasn't like a tour necessarily, you know, but it was me kind of schlepping around and like going to different places um, and talking and a combination of sort of formal presentations with my blazer on and um, and then sitting down with sort of small groups of uh, young people and talking uh, more informally. Um, but yeah, and uh, you know, but. Like, I can only do that, you know, so much, right? So. I have one last question. Okay. And that's the end of the question. And then uh, Lillian would like to say something. But um, 
Given human nature and the way it doesn't seem to change over the past couple hundred thousand, given human, given human, given human nature and the, I guess the fact that it hasn't changed very much over the past couple of thousand years, um, do you think there's much chance of? And given that when an invention is comes about, people want to make use of it and expand upon it and so on and so forth, do you think that there is a chance that the nuclear they would completely give up nuclear power. Do you think, I, I'm asking whether... I got it, I got I'm it. I'm asking whether Greta believes or feels that we will ever really voluntarily give up the use of nuclear power or nuclear weapons. Given that man does have certain little weaknesses where they like to go around knocking each other off. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am... Um, the music just got particularly loud, I thought. But uh, I mean, I think, I think human nature has changed, right? Like that we have evolved um, and uh, we have changed um, a lot uh, in the last even couple hundred years, last hundred years. Um, and in some positive ways and you know, obviously some negative ways as well, um, but that we continue to change. Um, and, uh, and I think we've got to, We've got to think that it's possible to get rid of this stuff, you know. Uh, we've got to think uh, that the abolition of nuclear weapons is, is possible and that can be brought about by our effort, you know. Like we just, we have to think that way um, or it won't, or it really won't happen. Otherwise yeah. we'd all sink into depression. Otherwise we'll just kind of drag <laughs> ourselves down West End well, Avenue. human nature is to survive. Yeah, and yes. survive, as she it's, says, yeah, right. we might survive in a deformed yeah. way. Though. Depends on us. Yeah. What we Depends do. on us. Right. If we, if we, if we yeah. uh, organize, if we march, if we resist. About 30 years we'll ago, win. they had almost a million people in Central Park. The question is, what happened after that? Well, okay. Wait, Lillian, well, wait, Lillian, 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 before you begin, I want to send, that. thank you very much. Well, thank you. you yeah. yeah, thank you guys. There are some petitions on the table put out by New York State, Peace Action New York State, uh, asking, uh, asking you to sign the petition which will be sent down to President Bush, uh, President Me? Ah, I have a backup chair. Just for the ask you to not support the end. Okay. All right. Uh, there are just two very short things that we want to do. Um, we're trying to be over by 9 o'clock. So uh, first of all, I want to call on Corinne here who is going to make an announcement of an up and coming meeting that the grannies are having. And since we're both grannies, Corinne, you make the announcement. Okay. And loud. Uh, this is the No Base Committee of the Granny Peace Brigade, and we are going to be having uh, a big meeting, uh, the title of which is The U.S. and the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. This is also, first of all, it's in honor of uh, Martin Luther King, who uh, a week after that, uh, he made a speech against uh, the Vietnam War, and it's at the same place, at the Riverside Church, yeah. and it will be uh, Sunday, March 28th. Uh, we will be having uh, Frida Berrigan speak for us again. It won't be a reprise. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, <laughs> even a reprise is good. Right. But uh, also, uh, Viney Burroughs is going to be the moderator, and uh, we're having Professor Horace Campbell, who will speak on the connection with Africa, and also we're going to have a short film that I believe you're going to have something to do with on Diego Garcia. Does anybody, does everybody know what that is? Diego Garcia is a small island in the Indian Ocean be between Africa and India. And uh, what happened was it was owned by Britain, and Britain kicked all the native population off that island and sent them to another island, Mauritius, uh, and where they're in deep poverty and starving, uh, and set up a huge 
military base for the United States. It, it's owned by Britain, but, it, but it's the base <coughs> is the U.S. base, and it's a huge base. Uh, and uh, the film is very, very hot, hot breaking. breaking. Right. It's very strategic. What From there, they can bomb Iraq. Bases. One of 880 bases. I know. That I, I wrote have. a song about that. Oh, uh, oh, oh, also the Raging Granny. What time? What time? Oh, oh it's what time from that's 1 better? to 4 30. It's a Sunday. Refreshments will be served. And. Um, it's on Claremont Avenue. Yeah. It is the building on Claremont Avenue of when you uh, go up to, uh, to 124th Street and, and uh, Claremont Avenue. 120th Street and Claremont Avenue. Uh, well, I'm, we have. We have more material, and you can get it on the Granny Peace Brigade website. But we'll 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 be we'll be giving you more material on we this. We have leaflets. And yes. I can give them yeah. to you. To okay. All right. Uh, speaking about the Diego Garcia, I'll just add one or two one thing about it. My husband was a former merchant marine, and when you are on a ship carrying supplies, you go to the Diego Garcia, and you have to stay there for six months. And then they let you come home for a vacation, or you can quit and you know take another ship. And he would never take a ship to go to the Diego Garcia because he was against the thing when they took that yeah. island away from the people who but lived there and set up the base. So that was a little little personal thing. Some of the pictures that they showed that they, the, the army and navy, uh, the navy yeah. was having a great time there. Oh, they, they, yes, they took them ashore once a week. They have great time there. Anyhow. I want to end up by thanking you all for coming. And the question comes up all the time, how can we get the people to join? How can we get more people involved, et cetera? We all have to begin to talk to people. We have to begin to talk to them because that's how we're going to get people to join us. If you belong to a Democratic Party club, talk it up in your club. Tell them to come join us or organize a peace committee within your club. If you belong to a readers group, and some people do belong to a readers group. You can organize your readers group and become part of Peace Action. But the, the whole thing about it is people keep asking this question, how are we going to get people? How are we going to change things? And the important thing is that we have to begin to think imaginatively. And I'm talking to Joe about maybe we could have a, a, uh, our own program on, uh, on uh, the radio, on, on television. We could have our own peace show. And he'll, I'm sure he'll be willing to help us because he offered a couple of years ago. I'll take you up on that, Joe. We can have our own show. We can have our own speakers. We can do, do what we want on it. And so this is what we have to do. We have to raise money to buy ads in local newspapers, not just in the New York Times, but in local newspapers. Right. You know, we have to begin to go on radio. So all these things, and we need people. We are a fairly large group, Westside Peace Action. We, you know, we think we have about 200 members, but not enough people are active. And we need more people to do things and to help out. And, and so I congratulate you for coming tonight. The weather was pretty awful.